Imagine you're in Baltimore, Maryland in the mid-1990s. It's summer, it's hot, you're hungry. You come across a new person selling roast beef sandwiches and you decide to buy one. Are you eating pig or are you eating human meat? That's an urban legend that we're going to be talking about today while discussing Baltimore, Maryland serial killer Joe Matheny, here today on Deep Lore. Hi everyone, my name is Matt Jarbo. Welcome back to another episode of Deep Lore. It is the 10th of October 2021 and today we're going to be talking about a very sick and twisted person, but also a person who could be seen as a massive un reliable narrator. I'm talking about the self-proclaimed serial killer Joe Matheny, who is a man heavily rumored around the internet to have chopped up his victims and served them to unsuspecting customers of his burger cart. And that story is one that, as wild as it seems, has no corroboration. But we're going to be talking about that, his life, everything about him here on the show today. But before we dive in, I would love it if you guys would head over to iTunes and leave a review of the podcast. I will start reading off reviews as they come on in just to give a little bit of a shout out to the people who listen. We are getting a growing number of new listeners every single week. So thank you guys for that. The TikTok is growing. That's at Deep Lore TV, where I cover true crime pretty much every day. And that's now roughly about 21,000 followers. So thank you to everybody who's been checking that out. And of course, patreon.com forward slash Matt Jarbo is a great way to support Deep Lore. If you happen to want to do that, it's all good. Also, I've been working on deeplore.tv, getting the website up and running, at least the first stages of the website up and running. I'm currently back cataloging all the previous episodes and determining how much money I want to give WordPress because that's just... Unfortunately, a reality of having a website through them, it's kind of insane. But with that aside, why don't we dive in to today's episode? Because the story of Joe Matheny is not one you want to miss. Joe Matheny was born into a poor family in West Virginia, where he was one of six children. Later on in life, he told his lawyer that his parents, who he claimed were dead, left him alone as a child, neglected him frequently, and sent him to foster-like homes. But some of those stories don't match up with what his mother remembers, because she's not dead. She said that when he was growing up, her son was a normal boy. He was smart. He grew up well. And if no one paid attention to him, it was his own fault. She also said that none of her children had ever been sent to live with other families. You know, as I was reading this story, as I was putting it together, I'm trying to get information on Matheny's background, on his history. There's really not much that's there. But... It does start to show you, as some of these recollections come on in, just what Matheny has said to lawyers and in confessions, allegedly, and things like that, and how the guy was a very frequent liar up until the day he died. And it really does make a lot of this story kind of seem more like an urban legend rather than anything else, which is why I kind of wanted to lead with that example in the cold open, simply because we don't necessarily know how much of this is accurate. If I had to kind of tie it into current pop culture, I would say go and look at 2019's Joker. It's a fantastic movie, but the character of Arthur Fleck is very much an unreliable narrator, and it makes you really question if what you saw actually happened. And this is one I want you guys to really pay attention to because I'm not calling anyone out specifically on YouTube or does a true crime storytelling, but I've noticed that the more sensational side of the story, the one that we will be getting to very much is what leads the charge. However, there's a lot more uh, you have to kind of question about that as we go through with this. Now, Jean Matheny, who was Joe's mother, said that she and her husband, who worked as a laborer, struggled to make ends meet. And they moved to North Point Boulevard in the area of Essex and Baltimore just before Joe was born. But sadly, when Joe was only six years old, his father died in a tragic car accident. And this was very hard for the family. His mother said that they were somewhat poor and that she had to work multiple jobs as a waitress, a bartender, and a food truck driver. She said that she had given her children a normal family life and that they had never gone hungry or been sent to live with other families. She did claim that she couldn't have spent every minute with her family, but they were still normal. And I think a lot of single parents, 
are like that. I had a single mom growing up. I remember being sent to daycare. I remember being sent to my family, being sent to wherever I had to be sent to in order to let my mom go to work. It was a struggle that she went through, but she still did what she could in order to make sure that I had a roof over my head, that I had toys, I had clothes, that I was loved. And that's something that I think every single parent out there really does try to do. But there is a psychological impact on the child who may not know exactly the extent of what it is that's going on. Children, as we know, want love. Children want support. Children want to be heard and they want to be accepted and they go through many different phases the younger they are. As I've said before, I have a uh, four-year-old and I have a three-year-old and as I've been learning as a parent, the terrible twos is generally a lie. It's probably going to be the terrible threes through five and I'm currently in the middle of both of that with my children and I love them to death, but again, I don't want them to feel neglected. If I'm at a space where I'm having trouble being with them because of how demanding they are and I still work two jobs. So I get all that. I understand exactly what Joe's mother would be thinking. And I'm curious to think of it from his perspective where he might be looking at it and going, I'm being neglected. And she even says earlier on, if he ever, if no one ever paid attention to him, it was his own fault. And I found that to be a very interesting line where you've got a mother who is clearly, you know, raising six kids, working multiple jobs on her own, stressed to the max. And then she says after, of course, it comes out that her son is a homicidal maniac, that if no one paid attention to him, it was his own fault. Well, what does that mean? I'm no child psychiatrist, but I can't help but wonder. I can't help but question if that is her very much trying to subconsciously deflect from any kind of potential responsibility for how she raised him. Some people are born broken. We all know this. This isn't something that needs to even be debated or argued. It's it's a fact. But I do think that having, you know, parents that are there and, and can really have a good impact on the kids. And I feel that in this particular case with what she's experiencing is probably shame but it is manifesting itself in a way that comes across as well as his own damn fault. I had nothing to do with it. I did what I had to do. They had a good life. He's just a bastard sort of thing. And I feel like that's more like per- she's trying to protect herself than maybe acknowledging that to some extent, I don't want to say she failed her child because I don't think that's fair to say on her, but to some extent she is just kind of obfuscating from the reality of the situation. But she did speak highly of Joe, at least what she remembers. She says that he loved riding his bike, that he was smarter than most kids. He didn't like to fight with other kids, that he was always really nice and never at all mean. However, that was going to come to an end in 1973 when he was just 19 years old and he joined the army. After that, the pair simply stopped talking. According to reports, even back when he was 19, he was still known as being smart, well-spoken, and he studied physics while he was in the military. But this is where we start getting to some of the unreliable narrator stuff. Because Joe here claims that when he was in the military, he was in an artillery unit in Vietnam, and it was here where he became addicted to heroin. But when asked about this, his mother said she never remembered him going to Vietnam. And by the time he was even in the military, we were generally out of Vietnam. So that was clearly a lie on his part. But it's just a way, again, to say, look, a lot of guys in the military ended up getting addicted to opioids and heroin while they were over in Vietnam. He probably ended up getting addicted to that while he was in the military and just used it again as an excuse. And I understand this because I had a a good friend of mine who was a heavy stoner in high school, was also an Eagle Scout, but had no real life ambition. His mother got him to join the Navy. It took forever to get him off of drugs and to get the drugs out of his system. And when he joined the Navy, he ended up getting hooked on methamphetamines. And one of the reasons why he got hooked on methamphetamines is because it was all over the ship. And he is a very highly addictive personality. So once he got into meth in order to stay awake while doing the shifts that they asked him to do, 
he just became addicted again. And that ultimately led to him being booted out of the Navy. So it is entirely something where people join the military. There's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, and they have to take substances in order to keep going. And we don't talk about that enough, to be honest with you. We really don't talk about that enough, but I've seen it firsthand. And so I understand what Joe Matheny is saying here. It's not an excuse, but it might give you a little shred of understanding into the mentality of him at the time, because his mom did say that for his change, because after he moved out, joined the military, the two stopped talking. They rarely called or wrote to one another. Their relationship basically dissolved into nothing, and they didn't even speak to each other for 10 years. And his mother does, in fact, blame drugs. And I think that was probably a big part of it myself. But a couple years later, Joe ended up getting out of the military and he worked in lumber yards and as a truck driver. During this time, he led a relatively normal life and didn't do anything worse than commit some assault, acting out while he was drunk and getting into a few bar fights. Nothing to be too proud of, but also nothing that's going to get you talked about in a litany of YouTube videos and podcasts. But then in 1994, something happened that pushed him down the very, very dark path and brings him to the point of this story. In 1994, Joe was living in South Baltimore with his girlfriend and their six-year-old son. He was working as a truck driver, spent long periods of time on the road, and one day when he got home, he walked in, found the apartment empty. His girlfriend and their child were gone. She was addicted to drugs just like he was, and Joe believed that she had ran away with another man and started living on the streets with him. Rage took over. Joe got very, very angry. He looked for them for days. He went to halfway houses. He went to homeless camps. He was looking underneath bridges. Anywhere he thought his girlfriend and son could potentially be because this is where she would go to buy drugs. He didn't find her in any of those places, especially underneath the bridge. When he found the bridge, he found two homeless men, Randall Brewer and Randy Piker. And Joe believed that these two men knew who his girlfriend was, and he believed that they knew where she was. And when he questioned them and when he pressed them, they didn't say anything to give any information to that. They gave no info as to where this girl was, where the kid was. And by this point in time, he was so angry, he was so frustrated, he was so rage-induced that he snapped. And he went over and grabbed an axe that he had hidden in a nearby rotting sofa and he killed them both. And it was here, after he finished killing them, that he allegedly saw a fisherman nearby. And he believed in his rage that the fisherman could have seen what he had done. So he left no witnesses. And then he apparently threw all three bodies into a nearby river. However, in 1995, he was charged with the double homicide. But Joe was found not guilty of the murders in a Baltimore circuit court. And the reason why is because during deliberations, the jury sent the judge a note saying that they thought another homeless man did the killings. And that was because there was an argument at the time over a dispute between rival homeless camps. But later on, when Joe was caught, he did confess to killing these men. And he said that he did it after drinking beer all night so he could get $300 from one of them. Now, I'm just going to go on a limb. I'm going to suggest that perhaps a homeless gentleman living underneath a bridge probably didn't have $300 in cash, especially if that was a very big drug hangout. But it all ties back into the confession and the unreliable narrator. Because Joe says things when he confesses to things and we're meant to believe him. But if he had killed these men, don't you think that the authorities would have been able to depend on him? They would have had an idea. But in 1995, Joe was tried for the murder of these two men because their bodies had been discovered back in 95 after another man named Larry Amos used that same murder weapon, an axe that he had found, to kill another man named Everett Dowell. Their bodies were all discovered around the same time, but a jury had decided that there wasn't enough evidence to actually convict Joe of murdering both Brewer and Piker, so they let him go. 
But later on, Joe did confess to killing them after drinking beer all night so he could steal $300 from them. Personally, I think that's a little hard to believe. It does start to tie back into the unreliable narrator aspect of it, because if he was going on this rampage trying to find out what happened to his kid and he killed these two guys in a fit of rage, why would he then later on claim, oh, I did it for $300? Never mind the fact that these two guys were living in an area known for the buying, selling, and using of drugs. So would they have 300 in cash on them? I don't know. Some things about this just start to not add up. But because Joe ended up getting away with it, I believe it emboldened him to keep going. This is where we find out that he killed Kimberly Lynn Spicer in 1996 when he stabbed her to death. And less than a month later, he and another woman named Rita Kemper were taking drugs together in his trailer on the property of the company he worked at. He then tried to engage in sex with her. She refused him. And when she refused, he chased her, grabbed her, dragged her back to the trailer, beat her, and then tried to assault her. And when she kept fighting back, he said that he was going to kill you and bury you in the woods with the other girls. She was somehow able to get out of the trailer, climb through a window, and ran to the nearby police to call for help. It was in the aftermath of this that Joe immediately called his friend to get help in burying Kimberly Lynn Spicer's body. Now, he had told Kemper that she was in the woods with all the others, very Ted Bundy-ish. However, that was a lie. Her body was located in the factory that he was working at and living in since he had killed her a month before. When his friend found out about Joe's deed, that dude straight up called the cops immediately and Joe was arrested and charged with killing her on that day, December 15th, 1996. But it's here that we have to go back a year before the double axe homicide when we find out that Joe killed a 39-year-old Kathy Ann Magaziner and buried her body in a shallow grave near the factory where he worked. More than two years had gone by without anyone moving the body. Joe admitted that he had killed her by strangulation and that six months after he had killed her, he had gone back, dug up her bones, put her head in a box and thrown it away. He did take the police to the shallow grave where he had placed her headless body after reburying it. And even though most of her skull was gone, police were able to figure out that it was Kathy Ann Magaziner's body by looking at her dental records. But what's crazier is that Joe came out and claimed to have killed more women and that he dumped their bodies in a nearby river. But when police searched that river, no bodies were ever found. And then in reality, like I said, we don't know how much of what Joe Metheny said was actually true. And that's what brings me to this point that I've been wanting to get to, that I've been hinting at, that I've been alluding to, the unreliable narrator. In many ways, what I'm going to read to you guys next cannot be proven. Wikipedia doesn't talk about it. No official reports on the case talk about it, but people on the internet and a lot of the people covering this story, they believe it. They think that it's true. They think that this man was a murderer who fed his victims to people who didn't know what was going on from a small food truck in Baltimore. It's an urban legend in the city. People have it confirmed this on Reddit that I've seen, but no corroborating official source backs it up. This particular confession at this point can only be found on murderpedia.org, and there is no corresponding link, live or archived, to back up where this came from. This apparently is Joe Ray Matheny's confession, and I'm going to read it to you verbatim because I want you to listen to what people on the internet are believing is real. And I actually, to be fair, hope that this is not real because of how disturbing it is. It all started back in July of 1994. I was at work. I was a truck driver. I was working overtime this one night, then I got off and went home as I always did. But when I opened the door and turned on the light, I noticed nothing was there. My old lady had taken everything, including my son, and left me. Her leaving was not my problem, but she took my six-year-old son with her. She was a crack addict and a worthless piece of shit. I would have paid to get her out of my life. 
All she had to do was take my son over to my mother's house and she could have had everything else and be gone. I found out six months later that she had moved to the other side of town with some asshole that was selling her ass for drugs. They got busted for drugs and they took my son away from them for neglect and child abuse. I had no chance of going to social services and trying to get my son back due to my past criminal record. So I took it upon myself with the hatred I had for these two who lost my son to go looking for them. I had found out from someone that they were going under a bridge and getting high with some homeless motherfuckers who lived under that bridge. I went there looking for them. They were not there, but the two homeless motherfuckers they got high with them were down there. They were passed out on some old stinking mattress, and that's where they were when I left. Except they were dead from being chopped up. That same night, I lured the first crack whore down under that bridge. I got her high and was trying to get information out of her about my old lady's whereabouts. She acted like she didn't know, so I beat the hell out of her and raped her ass then killed her. I put her in some bushes and went and lured the second bitch down there, and I did the same to her as the last one. But as I was about to throw her in the bushes with the other one, I noticed an old black man down by the river fishing looking back up at me. I grabbed a steel pipe that was lying by and I ran down on him and laid his head wide open. So I put the two girls and him in the river and weighed them down with rocks. That was a very busy night for me, five murders within seven hours. I washed up in the river and cleaned up the crime scene as much as I could, and then left. Two to two and a half weeks later, I was arrested and charged with the murders of the two men I chopped up. I spent close to 18 months in Baltimore City Jail waiting to go to trial. The trial lasted one week, and it was thrown out because of lack of evidence. I was free again. I went back and talked to my old boss and to give me my job back at the pallet company. There was a little trailer on the property, so I told my boss to let me stay there and I could keep an eye on the place. He agreed to this and gave me the keys to the front gate in the main building. The company was on a dead-end road and very isolated. It was perfect for what I wanted to do. I lured two more crack whores up there to my trailer. I killed and butchered their bodies up. I cut the meat up and put it in some Tupperware bowls and put it in a freezer. I buried the remains in several shallow graves in the little woods behind the company. Over the next couple of weeks on the weekends, I opened up a little open pit beef stand. I had real roast beef and pork sandwiches, and why not? They were really good. The human body tastes very similar to pork. If you mix it together, no one can tell the difference. Everything was going pretty good until I ran out of my special meat. So I lured another bitch up to my trailer, got her in there and started to rip her clothes off, knocking the hell out of her. She was screaming but there was no one around to hear her except me, and I just kept laughing at her. I turned around for a split second, and that was my mistake, for she ran out the door before I could get to her. There was an eight-foot chain-link fence with barbed wire on top of it around the front of the company. There was a stack of wooden pallets next to the fence about ten feet high. That bitch scaled those pallets like a monkey and jumped the fence, then ran down to the main road where some guy in a pickup truck picked her up and took her to a nearby gas station, where she called the cops. Well, I knew the cops were on their way, but I didn't run. I gathered up her clothing, grabbed the keys to the gate, and went out and opened it. Soon as I stepped out of the gate, a cop car pulled up, and the cop jumped out, pulled his gun on me, and told me to get on the ground. And that is where it all came to an end. They took me down and booked me. She had told them that I said I was going to kill her like the rest, which was true. They had me sitting in a little room down at Homicide, drilling me and damn near kissing my ass, trying to find out what I had done. They pulled me out of city jail every day for a month, taking me back and forth between the company and the bridge. I had they going crazy at the company for digging up the remains of those two bitches there, because I had the remains buried in seven different holes. The only thing I feel bad about in any of this is I didn't get to murder the two motherfuckers I was really after. And that's my ex-old lady and the bastard she got hooked up with. Well, that's my story. Horrible but true. So the next time you're riding down the road and you happen to see an open pit beef stand that you've never seen before, make sure you think about this story before you take a bite of that sandwich. Sometimes you never know who you might be eating. Ha ha. How do you know if this is even true? Especially that last line there. It just reads like an urban legend. But there are people in Baltimore who seem to think that this is real. So it's going to clearly stay an urban legend. And that's maybe part of the charm of it. I think that there are stories like this at times where we simply 
want to kind of have an idea in our head. Like we don't want it to, we don't want reality. We want the fictionalized version. It's not that the fictionalized version is better to process. It just, you know, you, you ask yourself how horrible somebody could be. And then you look at it and you go, okay, if they're this horrible, I can kind of understand it. It just seems weird. Our, our processing abilities like that are kind of crazy. You know, I mean, look at the fact that like one of the Menendez brothers married a playboy playmate while he was locked up for murdering his parents. You know, it's a very weird thing. Humans are weird like that. But here's a little bit of reality for you. Joe wasn't arrested when he walked out of the gate. He was arrested with his former boss when they were leaving a Christmas party. This is after the authorities conducted an investigation and were able to get enough evidence to arrest him for the crime of a kidnapping Rita Kemper. It all goes back to what I keep saying about the unreliable narrator and how certain things are being reported as true when they're clearly not. But no matter what, doesn't matter what he says was true or fake or whatever, what we do know for fact is that in 1997, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison for kidnapping and trying to sexually assault Kemper. He was apparently found not guilty of trying to kill her, which is really weird considering that there were the threats, there's the other accusations, there's the attempt, you know, the double homicide he was acquitted of a couple years prior. A lot is there in his MO that would, you know, you'd probably be able to at least get that conviction. But okay, sure. However, in 1998, he was given a death sentence for killing Spicer. And at his sentencing hearing, he said that he killed people because he liked it and he got a rush out of it and that he had no real reason other than he liked to do it. And additionally, in 1998, he did admit to the 1994 killing of Kathy Ann Magaziner and stealing from her. The prosecutors in that case also wanted to get the death penalty, but he was given a sentence of life in prison. Then two years later, his death sentence was actually overturned and it was changed to life in prison without parole. And there he sat at the Western Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland for 17 years, where on August 5th of 2017, he was found dead in his cell at the age of 63. And the results of his autopsy have not been released to the public. Can I just say good? Am I allowed to say that? I never really know what the acceptable approach is when covering some of these stories. But I think you guys are like me. You're just happy that this massive, and this guy was massive, he was huge, he was a massive guy, piece of crap was just removed from existence. We don't know why he died or how he died, and I don't really care. I'm just glad he can't hurt anybody else. This is a guy that I feel, looking at everything I've been able to find about him, is one that always felt like he was the victim. He felt neglected, and I believe underappreciated, and he never lived up to his own ambitions. And getting hooked on the heroin in the military, I think, is one of the things that sent him down that path. It unfortunately pushed him to a place where he felt that he needed to commit these crimes. But at the end of the day, this is all power. This is a guy who clearly felt like he had no power, who felt like he was just someone tossed aside. But he had power over those who he killed. He had power over those that he stalked that he lured to his locations he was able to use that and his size he was six foot one very overweight large framed big guy known as tiny and he used this to overpower his victims and he chose women who had addiction problems and he chose people that were not going to be looked at other killers like samuel little has also done this where they go after the downtrodden and the forgotten because they know no one will come looking and that is always the saddest part that our society forgets that these people exist. And we do so willingly because we don't know how to handle the problem. And because we don't have a lot of investment in mental health programs that are very available. This is, look, I'm telling you guys this right now. This is, good, this is a take. I don't know how many of you guys are conservative and I don't want to be too political. I do think a lot of the problems with like homelessness and mental health could be solved by having adequate health care provided to every citizen in this country, having money put aside to be able to help them out of these situations and help them get what they need in order to become more functioning members of society and to not just be forgotten and tossed aside and quite frankly, tossed to the wolves for psychopaths like Joe Matheny, who can just target them, quite frankly, without any real consequence. Because remember, he butchered those two guys 
and then was acquitted of it because there wasn't enough evidence to, to suggest that he or to prove that he did it beyond a reasonable doubt. And the jurors basically thought some other guy did it. So, you know, it, it's probably because in many instances they don't care. And that is something I think we need to kind of look at introspectively and, and maybe have those conversations with ourselves. But that being said, as always, I want to hear your thoughts on this. So please find me at deeplore.tv on TikTok. You can find me deeplore.tv, the website. I'm on Instagram at real Matt Jarbo. Um, I don't post as much over there. I do need to get the deep lore Instagram up and running. Uh, but I'm also on Twitter at M Jarbo. If you guys want to find me over there, if you're watching this on YouTube, please leave a comment. Let me know your thoughts. And if you have any suggestions for stories you want me to cover in the future, let me know. I'll talk to you guys next week. Have yourself a great day. And thanks for listening to deep lore where we keep it on the DL.